Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the IST lecture, which will be given by Professor Thomas Sutov from Stanford. So the goal of the IST lecture series is, as you all know, to introduce eminent researchers and their work to a wide audience of scientists and to the general public. And I think the choice of our today's speaker fits perfectly into this intention and, and this goal, uh, because uh, clearly uh, Professor Zutov is one of the outstanding members of the neuroscience uh, community. And at the same time, I know from several talks uh, he has given and I have attended, that he is also able to explain the key ideas and concepts uh, to the public. So, brief introduction, many of you will know the CV of uh, Tom Sutov. He originally studied medicine in Aachen and uh, Göttingen. He then obtained his MD uh, with a doctoral thesis uh, in the lab of Victor Whittaker on the biophysical structures of chromaffin granules, so already somehow related to synapses. He then continued as a postdoc uh, at that place in uh, Göttingen and then moved uh, to uh, UT Southwestern as a postdoc and then started a uh, ramp up uh, career uh, that um, went up from the assistant investigator to the assistant professor to the associate professor and finally full professor level. He had a short intermezzo in 95 as a director of a Max Planck Institute for Experimental Medicine in Göttingen and then went back to UT Southwestern in several functions. Uh, and in 2008, uh, he finally decided uh, to change to Stanford, a very attractive place in neuroscience with several interesting groups and uh, challenges, where he has been working ever since. So Tom Sutov, as many of you will know, is uh, very famous for several fundamental discoveries in neuroscience. One is the discovery of the calcium sensor that initiates synaptic transmission, uh, synaptotagmin. Uh, but he also has uh, discovered and shed light on several steps of what now is called the synaptic vesicle cycle that all happens aut autonomously in the presynaptic uh, terminal and understanding the sequence of events of recycling of the vesicles uh, goes uh, to his credit uh, to a large uh, extent. And finally, he has been working on very extensively on the molecular logic of uh, connectivity uh, of presynaptic and postsynaptic components uh, of synapses. And he has identified several key proteins uh, that are importantly involved in that uh, process, uh, neurexin uh, being one of them and neuroligin uh, also uh, being uh, the counterpart uh, on the postsynaptic side. Finally, uh, needless to say, he received uh, ver several outstanding recognitions for his work, uh, the most important ones being the Kavli Prize in Neuroscience in 2010 and the Nobel Prize in uh, Physiology and Medicine in 2013. So we are all very grateful, Tom, that you came here. Today there are two Toms here in the front row, so I have to distinguish very clearly. We are very grateful you came. We are very grateful you spent the time here. Uh, and um, uh, having a transatlantic flight is uh, not so uh, entertaining sometimes. So we are very happy you are here. And we are all very excited, I think the scientists as well as uh, the public visitors, to listen to your talk which is towards a molecular logic of neuronal circuits. Thanks a lot for coming. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for this kind introduction. <laughs> um, you know, there's some seats here. And if you guys want to just be comfortable, OK? There's actually a lot of seats here. Um, there's also some seats right there in the middle. Uh, so it's a pleasure for me to be here. This is a beautiful place. Everything is new. Everything seems to work gorgeously. Uh, you really are privileged in having such a wonderful environment. And I had a great day. And I hope, I expect, I'll have a a great evening, and I hope you'll have a, a great 
hour in the next uh, hour. Uh, <laughs> uh, in my talk, I want to discuss an ongoing project in my lab. And that project, maybe not surprisingly, regards the brain. I think even neuroscientists, even non-neuroscientists, just people who work on other things for inexplicable reasons, um, might recognize that this is a brain. And I'm illustrating this here in order to just a very crude level illustrate how complex the brain is. The brain is enormous, not only in terms of overall size and weight, but if you consider the number of neurons, trillions of neurons, each of which on average elaborates thousands and thousands of synapses forming overlapping networks. The complexity that is present here is vastly higher than the complexity of the human genome. Progress in the last decade or so has enabled, finally, some would say, deciphering the sequence of the human genome, and we now have a pretty good idea about what the genome looks like. We still don't understand it, even though its complexity is so much lower than the complexity of the brain with its uh, trillions of neurons. So um, it's been a major challenge, and I think it will be a major challenge to make progress in trying to understand how the brain works. Much of the, what's happening at this institute is devoted to that challenge, and it's going to be even long, bigger challenge to understand how brain disorders, diseases, affect the brain. The biggest, arguably the most important progress in this challenge recently has been in genetics. And that is due to the enormous technological advances in gene sequencing. In recent years, many of the diseases that were up to now inscrutable, enigmatic, have been probed by genetics. And disorders such as schizophrenia and autism have been described in genetic terms. This has led not only to the fundamental discovery that was totally unexpected, that the human genome is very fluid, that it changes from generation to generation, that there's enormous variation between humans, not only in terms of different families, but also within families. It has also led to the realization that many of the common neuropsychiatric disorders are associated with mutations in a large number of genes, in particular autism. And what you see here is just one exemplary recent paper that describes this. Here they talk about 71 risk loci. Different papers have different numbers of loci. They usually have the same authors, but. Anyway, that's a different issue, <laughs> because in that field, there's always tons of people in the same papers, and they're usually always the same people. I always wonder who reviews this, because everybody who works on this is, part, is a co-author. So. But anyway, um, it's a great system, you know? If you, everybody in a field is a co-author, and every paper gets published. Um, <laughs> but anyway, that's a, that's a different power. The point here is that we now have a large number of genes that are associated with these disorders. And the challenge is to try to understand what this means biologically. One way, and probably the only way that's currently uniformly applied is network analysis. And this was also done in this paper, for example. This is actually taken from that particular paper. And what you see here is a network that's based on uh, more or less unbiased analysis of these affected genes. And I just want to focus on one particular area here because it's relevant to my talk. And so there's all kinds of genes that are shown to be connected here. Indeed, this connection makes sense because that's what I'm going to talk about, that a gene called neurexin is connected to another gene called neuroligin because these are ligand receptor pairs. But there's others that are really not that connected at all. There's a cytoskeletal gene, there's a transcription factor, and there's others. So what these types of analyses provide is 
an initial step in an understanding. But what we now need, and what is a lot of the rationale for what we are doing, is to actually understand what the genes do. And so what I'm going to talk to you today about is one particular attempt to achieve that. So one particular attempt to actually try to dig here into gene functions and try to understand better how these genes work in the brain, what they do, and how mutations in these genes might lead to impairments in human uh, biology. And so I'm going to first introduce you to new accents and their ligands, because some of you, again, inexplicably, may not have heard about them before. Um, when you leave here today, you, I'm sure you'll remember. Um, and then I'll tell you two stories emerging from the lab, two stories that I chose to pre talk to you about today because they illustrate, hopefully exemplarily, the approaches we can take and the kinds of results we can get. They also illustrate, I believe, how we need to approach this in the long term and what kind of complexity we face in understanding biology of the brain. And so this is not an overview of the whole field. I'm not going to talk about what we know about neurexins, for example, or what we know about uh, transsynaptic signaling. I'm just going to focus in onto these two stories as exemplary approaches. So let me start with the introduction. It's always a good point to start. And come back to the fundamental explanatory unit of brain function circuits. Everybody who works on brain in neuroscience these days tries to explain the brain in terms of circuits. That's the one level that a molecular neuroscientist and the systems neuroscientist can talk to each other. And that's because, in some way, the brain consists entirely of overlapping and interlocked circuits. All circuits are composed of neurons that are connected with each other at synapses. Circuits, even simple circuits, are usually quite interesting in terms of how they process information. What you see here as an example is a simple feed-forward inhibitory circuit, where you have an excitatory parameter neuron that synapses onto another excitatory parameter neuron, but also onto an inhibitory neuron, which then synapses onto the same excitatory downstream parameter neuron. The point here is that these two synapses, these square blue elements, transfer information. They tr basically excite the postsynaptic cells. As a uh, thus, when you have stimulus trains going, spike bursts going down here, both neurons get excited, and then this provides a feed-forward inhibition. The precise amount of inhibition and excitation that happens on this downstream neuron depends very much on the properties of the synapses. The connectivity alone does not explain even a simple circuit as this, because neurons usually fire in patterns. They don't just fire rarely in isolation. And how a neuron actually, how much it excites the postsynaptic cell in both of these cases can differ between these two synapses and cannot be predicted just based on their connectivity. In order to understand circuits, we thus must understand not only connectivity, how synapses are formed, where they are formed, but we must also understand the properties of the synapses themselves. These properties are crucial in order to, in any ways, for example, calculate input-output relations for even the most simple <coughs> circuits. The properties of synapses in turn are determined by the pre- and postsynaptic neuron. Neurotransmitter release from the presynaptic neuron at these two synapses is almost always different in the brain in similar circuits. This is determined by the postsynaptic neurons, as classical work from the Sackman lab showed, whatever, 25 years ago. So this is probably due because there's transsynaptic signaling across the synapses that are most likely affected most likely affected by transsynaptic cell adhesion molecules. 
And neuraxins were the first such molecules discovered. They were discovered in work on this beautiful spider. It's a black widow spider, well known, unforgettable, especially for the mate. Um, <laughs> some experiences are just so good, they only happen once. Um, but it's also important because the black widow spider makes a toxin called alpha latotoxin, which binds to presynaptic terminals. It excites these terminals and elicits massive neurotransmitter release. Neuroexins were identified and cloned as the presynaptic receptors for these toxins. They look like typical cell surface proteins, like receptors or cell adhesion molecules. Neuroexins come in two flavors of principal forms, alpha neuroexins with a longer extracellular sequence composed of LNS and EGF-like domains, and beta neuroexins that are transcribed from an internal promoter of the alpha neuroexin gene and that are contain only a single LNS domain. Otherwise, they're typical type 1 transmembrane proteins. There's three genes for alpha and beta neuroexins. There's hundreds of mutations that have been identified in neurexins, in particular neurexin 1 in autism and schizophrenia. And neurexin transcripts are subject to extensive alternative splicing, leading to thousands of isoforms as confirmed with PAC biosequencing recently in our lab and also in Peter Scheifele's lab. The gene mutations in autism and schizophrenia are interesting because there are so many of them and they are so different. Most of them are in neurexin 1 because the neurexin 1 gene is huge. It covers more than one megabase and they represent CNVs, sometimes small, sometimes big CNVs. They are nearly always associated with psychological pathology, but there is no uniform psychological pathology. They can be associated with autism, with schizophrenia, or other forms of neuropsychiatric impairments. These impairments are not specific to particular mutations, but sometimes in the same family, the same mutation can be associated with two different disorders. The diversity of phenotypes with which these mutations are associated suggests that although the penetrance of these mutations is almost 100%, the specific manifestation clinically depends on additional factors, such as genetic background and or specific experiences, infections, maybe other lifetime experiences that differ between individuals. These mutations are always heterozygous. In a recent study, we asked whether these mutations would actually infer, confer onto synapses an impairment. So we generated conditionally mutant human neurons that had a heterozygous impairment in neurexin 1. And as you can see here in this exemplary slide, using electrophysiology with these neurons, we did observe a major impairment in excitatory synaptic transmission in that, in these heterozygous mutant deletions. There was a significant decrease in the frequency of spontaneous minis, but not the amplitude of minis. And there was a significant decrease in this amplitude of evoked synaptic transmission, consistent with an impairment in presynaptic neurotransmitter release. These experiments are thus confirmatory in the sense that they indicate that the heterozygous mutations of neurexin 1 can indeed cause a functional abnormality supporting the notion that even as a heterozygous mutation, these G mutations truly predispose to these diseases by conferring a functional impairment. A very interesting feature of neurexins that fascinated us from the very beginning was the extensive Baroque alternative splicing at these canonical six sites. Most of this alternative splicing is regulated, as it turns out, 
We initially demonstrated this 20 years ago using in situ hybridization, but we were interested to understand whether there might be a Nurexin code such that individual neurons types are characterized by one specific pattern of alternative splicing that is characteristic for a given type. To analyze this, to give you another example, we more recently performed a study where we patched slices in which we could identify, due to genetic markers, PV containing and CCK containing interneurons. These are different subclasses of interneurons. We then aspirated the cytosol from these neurons and used fluoridine based quantitative RT PCR to measure the levels and alternative splicing of a hundred or so different transcripts. Again, just exemplarily, what we found is that, for example, in comparing PV expressing versus CCK expressing interneurons, that they expressed neurexin 1 alpha at very different levels, but neurexin 1 beta at similar levels. We then analyzed the pattern of alternative splicing in these neurons for three splice sites, two, three, and four, as shown here. This was done by using specific primers that would differentiate between either the state where the alternatively spliced sequence is included or excluded. We found that when we did these analyses, that for splice site number two, there was a dramatic difference between the two different types. Note that alternative splicing in neurons, at least, is never black and white. It's always in between. This is important because it's been postulated, at least in the immune system, that it might be black and white. We never see this. So it's a sort of a, it's not a digital signal, it's an analog signal, if you want. What you can see here is that this is in, this is out, that there is a difference here between uh, the two different types of interneurons. The same difference is observed for splice site 3, and the opposite difference is observed for splice site 4. Among others, these experiments indicated that there is no canonical alternative splicing of neurexins at the same sites or at different sites, but also that there is a pattern that is specific for each given interneuron. In particular, note splice site number 4, which I'll come back to in a minute, which shows this dramatic difference in different types of neurons throughout the brain. So these experiments demonstrated that each neuron class seems to have a pattern of alternative splicing of neurexins that's correct, characteristic for this type and demonstrates also that there is a code in some sense. Note that this type of analysis cannot done be by single cell RNA-seq, which will never have the depth of sequencing, it's just not possible, at least not with current methods, that allows you to see differences like this as they occur. The alternative splicing of neurexins, as well as their localization on the surface of the presynaptic terminal, led to the immediate idea that these are cell recognition molecules that are regulated by expression of different isoforms and their various splice variants, and raised the issue of whether there's ligands postsynaptically that these molecules interact with. And indeed, over the years, we and others have identified tens of such ligands, quite a wealth, and not always welcome wealth of ligands, because there's a lot to work on. <laughs> but some of these are very interesting. What you see here is a representative sample of those that are the most interesting, at least in our minds. These are four different postsynaptic ligands that bind to presynaptic neurexins with nanomolar affinity. They bind to both alpha and beta neurexins at this particular part of the protein because that's what they share. They bind to these with nanomolar affinity despite the fact that they don't share any sequence homologies. So there's nothing like a neurexin consensus, neurexin binding sequence. They use different structural mechanisms to bind to overlapping sites on the same 
receptor or ligand, whatever you want to call it. What is also interesting, as it turns out, that these ligands, all of these ligands here, are all regulated by alternative splicing of splice head number four, which I mentioned to you earlier. And they are regulated differentially, such that, for example, cell balance only bind when there's an insert in splice head number four, whereas LRTMs only bind when there's no insert in splice head number four. For neural ligands, the first ligands that we identified, it's a little more complicated. Depending on the isoform of neural ligand and the alternative splicing of the neural ligand, it can be either splice head four plus or minus. Neural ligands may be the most important neurexin ligands because they are the only evolutionarily clearly conserved genes that bind to neurexins. And they are, they are present in multiple isoforms with diverse properties. Moreover, neuroligands, just like neurexins, are subject to gene mutations in autism. There's been quite a few of them, in fact. So this was my introduction to neurexins and their ligands. I think the key points to remember here is that these are highly polymorphic presynaptic cell surface proteins that based on the code-like nature of the alternative splicing may represent a cell recognition molecule on the surface that communicates signals to the other side, a subject that I'll come back to later. What I want to do now is tell you about our studies trying to understand what neurexins do in a limited manner for just one gene, neurexin 3. And the starting point of these studies is a conditional mutation that deletes all neurexin 3 variants, all splice variants, alpha and beta. And the motivation is that neurexin 3, just like neurexin 1, except by far not as frequently, has been linked to neuropsychiatric disorders. Neurexin 3 constitutive mutants are lethal, which is why we are using conditional ones. When we analyzed the conditional Neurexin 3 mutants using cultured hippocampal neurons that were infected with viruses and coding either a control protein or Cree recombinase, we observed an unexpected phenotype. We found that AMPA receptor mediated EPSCs, excited synaptic transmission, were impaired, but NMDAO receptor EPSCs were not nor were IPSCs. This was unexpected because both of these receptor types are postsynaptic. Neurexins are thought to be presynaptic. A presynaptic impairment would lead to an impairment of both types of EPSCs. The fact that only one type of EPSC was impaired suggested that this is a postsynaptic phenotype, as also indicated by measurements of miniature EPSCs not shown. So this led, led to the hypothesis that mutations in neurexin 3 may involve a postsynaptic AMPA receptor dependent phenotype. We measured the surface levels of AMPA receptors on these cultured neurons using immunocytochemistry. Non-permeabilized fixed neurons are probed with AMPA receptor antibodies that recognize the extracellular sequences of GLUA1 and then are permeabilized and uh, probed with intracellular epitopes, PSD95 and VGLUT1. What you can see here is that the density of synapses is unchanged, as expected, but that the size of the puncture, which reflects the amount of protein present, is decreased by the same amount as the APSC amplitude for AMPA receptors. There's a trend for PSC95, there's nothing for VGLUT1. This decrease in AMPA receptor surface levels is not due to a decrease in protein levels, total protein levels, because they're unchanged. So this experiment suggested that the neurexin mutation led to a depletion or loss of postsynaptic AMPA receptors. We explored whether this might be due to increased AMPA receptor endocytosis using a two-stage labeling protocol where you basically label neurons with AMPA receptor antibodies while they're still alive before you fix them. Then you incubate them or you chase them and then you fix them and you label them again. 
And with this protocol, we could show that indeed there is an increase, a significant increase in amphoreceptor endocytosis, so providing a suggest, provide an explanation for why there's fewer amphoreceptors. Now, this was very enigmatic for us at that point because how is it possible that this is this change? And one possible explanation is that developmentally new actions are needed and that they are needed for the elaboration of synapses in a way and that Nurexin 3 has a special role here. So we decided to test this by examining the possibility of rescuing the phenotype by reintroduction of Nurexins. And what we found is that when we took Nurexin 3 alpha and 3 beta rescue constructs that lacked an insert in splice at number four, we could fully rescue it, demonstrating that Nurexin 3 alpha and Nurexin 3 beta were fully functional. However, interestingly, when we used the same, pro same cDNAs or same proteins, but with an insert of splice at, in splice at number four, there was no rescue for either 3 alpha or 3 beta. So these experiments, as well as other experiments that I don't have time to discuss, demonstrated that all new exons could rescue as long as there was splice at number four minus, suggesting it's not the developmentally fixed phenotype, and also suggesting that since splice at number four is an extracellular play, uh, sequence, that this is an activity or function of neurexin 3 that is extracellular. So we went ahead and tested whether the extracellular sequences of neurexin 3 might be sufficient to rescue. We simply took neurexin 3 and attached the extracellular sequences and attached it to a GPI anchor on the surface of the muons, and this fully rescued, as you can see here, demonstrating that you d actually didn't need any signal transduction in the, term in the protein in the neurons that express this rescue construct. We were concerned that maybe neurexins act as a kind of autocrine or factor, like a secreted factor, especially the, since there are secreted versions of neurexin 3 that are encoded by certain splice variants. And so we tested these secreted splice variants of neurexin 3 and we could not rescue. So these experiments suggested that surface display of the extracellular sequences of neurexin 3 alpha or 3 beta were able to stabilize amper receptors postsynaptically as long as there was no insert in splice set number four. However, in these rescue experiments that we performed, like all rescue experiments, no matter what, you're always looking at overexpression. The problem with rescue experiments is that you never really get the same levels as the endogenous gene, and you all know that overexpression has massive problems. In fact, one of the slides already alluded to this. When you see this here, this is a decrease. Overexpression of neurexin 3 beta always inhibits neurotransmitter release. So neuro so overexpression has its own problems. We were concerned about this. And so we decided to use a genetic approach to test whether splicing of alternative splicing of splice at number four is really essential. This genetic approach involved mutating the exon that is alternatively spliced. Exon 20 is excluded in SS4 minus and included in SS4 plus. It has an unusual splice acceptor sequence, as you see here in the wild type. We argued that this probably explains why it can be either excluded or included depending on the signals that the cell receives. And so we converted this by homologous recombination in a perfect splice acceptor sequence with the hope that this would make this always included. And it worked. It was always included. We also flanked the axon with LOX P sites that would allow us to permanently take it out. And as a result, we have knock in mice in which Splice site number four is always included, but where query culminates causes constitutive excision of that splice variant. When we used this mouse, cultured neurons from this mouse, and analyzed it the same way that I showed you earlier, we found that it had exactly the same phenotype as the neurexin 3 alpha beta conditional knockout in cultured hippocampal neurons. There was a loss of ample receptor EPSCs, a decrease, about 50% compared to wild type or SS4 minus in the SS4 plus, 
No effect on NMDA receptor APSCs, no effect on IPSCs. This was also rescued by all SS4 neurexins, but not by SS4, SS4 minus neurexins, but not by SS4 plus neurexins. I forgot the minus here, I'm sorry. And moreover, it was also due to a loss of postsynaptic ampere receptors as validated by immunocytochemistry. So these experiments thus suggested that at least in the hippocampal, cultured hippocampal neurons, the phenotype that we observed in the knockout was entirely due to that one particular activity of neurexin 3 alpha or 3 beta. However, this is all in culture. And as many of you know, cultured neurons as a system is great, but it's a reduced system. It's a reduced system that allows you to do things you can't do in vivo. But it has the potential problem that what you, the conclusions are not valid for in vivo. And so we chose an in vivo approach to test this. And what we did is we used in a preparation that we increasingly used because it has analytic capabilities that few preparations have. We use stereotactic injections of viruses at P21 or P0, not shown into the CA1 region of the hippocampus. And as you can see here, these viruses encode CRE or control protein, actually mutant CRE, that is EGFP tagged. And you can see it's only expressed in the CA1 region of the hippocampus. We then, two weeks to three weeks later, <coughs> cut horizontal sections. You can see here the CA1 region is infected. We patch neurons in the subiculum that's not infected which is the major output region for CA1 pyramidal neurons, which send axons here to synapse onto the subiculum neurons, and we stimulate these axons with a stimulating electrode. This is almost perfect. It actually is perfect because the subiculum contains two types of pyramidal neurons that differ in their intrinsic electrical properties. These two types are called regular firing subiculum neurons because they fire regularly, as you can see here upon current injections, or burst firing subiculum neurons because they fire in bursts. These two types of neurons do not only differ in terms of their intrinsic electrical properties, but they also differ in terms of their long-term synaptic plasticity in an all-or-none manner. The regular firing neurons have a postsynaptic form of long-term potentiation, LTP, that is NMDA receptor dependent. The burst firing subiculum neurons have a presynaptic form of LTP that is NMDA receptor independent but seems to depend on presynaptic cyclic AMP signaling. So these two different types of neurons have very different types of long-term plasticity and thus represent an example of what I mean with synapse specification. Interactions between pre- and postsynaptic neurons in the synapse formation here leads to very different types of long-term plasticity. This preparation allows analysis of specifically presynaptic effects because we are only manipulating the presynaptic neurons here. And what we found is that when we use this preparation both on the knockout or on the knock-in, as shown here, Exemplarily, you see that in input-output curves, both burst-firing subiculum neurons and regular-firing subiculum neurons exhibit a relative decrease of about 40% in synaptic strength that is mediated by AMP receptors in the knock-in state. When we delete splice site 4 only in the presynaptic CA1 neurons, as shown here, it becomes wild-type. Here's even a slight overshoot, demonstrating that truly this is a presynaptic phenotype where presynaptic alternative splicing of neurexin 3 regulates postsynaptic ampere receptor levels independent of which pyramidal postsynaptic neuron it is. What about LTP? We tested both types of LTP. When we tested the NMDA receptor dependent form of LTP, as shown here, we found surprisingly to us that LTP was blocked in the knock-in stage, as shown here, but rescued 
by presynaptic excision of splice site number four as shown here. If anything, there's an overshoot. And this is summarized here. So in other words, presynaptic alternative splicing of neurexin three in this synapse gates postsynaptic RTP that's NMDA receptor dependent. We feel that this was surprising because LTP of this type depends on the regulated insertion triggered by NMDA receptor activation of AMPA receptors into the postsynaptic specialization. We thought that since there's fewer AMPA receptors to start off with, there is more dynamic range, and if anything, we would have expected more LTP instead of less LTP, demonstrating that, LT that here you have a signal where a presynaptic neuron actually, or splicing event in a presynaptic neuron determines whether the postsynaptic cell is competent to undergo LTP. Presynaptic neurexin 3 controls postsynaptic LTP, but presynaptic LTP, which I won't time for reasons, for re which I won't show for reasons of time, is not affected. How does this work? Well, the obvious implication is that you have a splice site 4 event that acts transsynaptically, so it must work via postsynaptic ligands. And indeed, when we look at the postsynaptic ligands in these various stages, we find that LRTM2 exhibits a 50% decrease postsynaptically in Neuraligon 1, a trend suggesting that that's indeed a postsynaptic ligand. What's interesting here is also that LRTM2, in more recent data show Neuraligon 1, is actually required for NMDA receptor dependent RTP itself. So is this what I described to you now as a function of neurexin 3, which validates the value of alternative splicing, the importance of alternative splicing? Is this the universal function of neurexin 3? Is that the function? And um, clearly it is not. And the best evidence that it is not was derived from a different preparation where we analyzed the neurexin 3 knock-in and knock-outs using, again, <coughs> physiology both in cultured neurons and in slices. I'm only going to show you one data slide from this analysis, or maybe two, I don't remember. Uh, but what you see here is a typical olfactory bulb culture, which is the preparation we are using. And you can see the mitral cells, which are big, and the granule cells, which are inhibitor and are small. When we recorded from this, in the neurexin 3 alpha beta knockout, conditional knockout, we found a completely different phenotype. There was no change in excitatory synaptic transmission. AMPA receptors were perfectly normal. But there was a more than 50% decrease in inhibitory synaptic transmission. This decrease was due to a presynaptic effect, due to a change in presynaptic release probability, and was independent of neurexin 3 alternative splicing because it could be fully rescued with neurexin 3 alpha containing an SS4. Insert, as shown here. In fact, in the wild type, there's an overshoot in the 3 alpha. <coughs> However, it could not be rescued with GPI anchored neurexin 3, suggesting that it's truly an event, a function that depends on now on intracellular signaling as opposed to the amperoceptor stabilization function, the transsynaptic amperoceptor stabilization, which is extracellular. So, this gives you an idea of the versatility of neurexins. Uh, using the example of neurexin 3 where we have the best understanding. And to summarize this briefly, what I've tried to tell you is neurexin 3 as a presynaptic molecule maintains postsynaptic AMPA receptors via an extracellular binding reaction, most likely an transsynaptic ligand interaction that depends on presynaptic alternative splicing of neurexin 3. And that's very different from what you see in the olfactory bulb as opposed to the hippocampus as another preparation where you have a completely different function that becomes manifest. How can we think about that? I'm going to show you an at high resolution model of neurexin 3 function. That's it. That is neurexin 3. The way we think about neurexin 3 is as a scaffold. It's as a scaffold like a Swiss army knife, which can do a lot of different things. It has a lot of different belts and whistles. If this is neurexin 3 alpha beta, there's something that regulates postsynaptic amper receptors and opens bottles of wine. There's another thing 
The ring is postsynaptic and a neuroreceptor dependent RTP. Presynaptic release probability. There's another function that I haven't discussed that we just published last year about postsynaptic endocannabinoid synthesis. And there's many other functions that we're currently trying to unravel. So if these molecule has so many different functions, why is it that different neurons have different phenotypes? The way we think about this is that most neurons express multiple neurexins that are alternatively spliced differentially. They're not coordinately alternatively spliced in all ways. As a result, there's redundancy for some functions but not for others. The functions that become manifest in the knockout state are due to what I would call functional bottlenecks in that in these particular neurons, those particular functions are not sufficiently redundant among the neurexins that are co-expressed and thus become manifest. Okay. In my last 15 minutes, I would like to move on and tell you about a second story, which is a very different approach and a very different type of work that I would like to describe to you. And it is focusing on a neurexin ligand, neuroligand, and specifically neuroligand 3. And the basis for this focus is that neuroligand 3 mutations have been observed repeatedly in autism. They are significantly associated with autism by human genetics as, done, as described in pioneering studies from Matt States, Evan Eichler, Mike Wigler, and other leading human geneticists. There has been both loss of function mutations due to deletions in neuroligand 3 that have been associated with autism, as well as point mutations, including a point mutation called R451C, which in fact was the first point mutation in any gene that was associated with idiopathic autism in pioneering work from uh, Thomas Bourgeron's lab more than 10 years ago. The strategy of this work that I'm now going to describe to you was to generate mice that genocopy these mutations. Mice that have either a knockout, which is the deletion, or knock-in mice, that is this point mutation, and to analyze these mice in comparison with each other. We actually historically started with the knock-ins because they were the first mutation described and later on did the knockout. And in this analysis what we found that puzzlingly, initially, we could not identify many phenotypes, especially in terms of physiology, that these two different types of mutations, which are both associated with autism and humans, induced in mice. In particular, the R451C knock-in caused many physiological phenotypes that were not observed in the knockout, suggesting that it has a dominant negative function. However, at the protein level, the R451C knock-in, this point mutation, destabilized neuroligand 3 in that there was also a loss of neuroligand 3 in addition to a remaining 10% of the mutant protein that then presumably causes a gain of function phenotype on top of the loss. So this made further progress in how neuroligand 3 might actually disturb overall brain function in a manner that it predisposes to autism in humans. And we set out to extend these types of analyses in additional studies that would get it a better way of looking at how such mutations might be predisposed to autism. Now one thing that was noticeable was that in the literature we and others had studied these mice in a variety of behavioral assays and found very little overlap in terms of their behavioral abnormalities. Specifically, the R451C mouse, that was actually the first model mouse of, neuro of idiopathic autism generated. We observed an increased ability to learn spatial memory in the water maze, whereas the neuroligand 3 knockout didn't have this phenotype. The R451C had a decreased social approach, but normal social memory, the knockout had a different one. 
So in looking at the literature, we postulated, we found that one particular symptom domain in a very general sense that's observed in human patients was not actually covered by any of these studies. And that were repetitive stereotypic behaviors. Autism characteristically leads to restricted interests and the ability to focus on one thing and to do this over and over again. And so, in doing this as an aside, we are not trying to actually analyze autistic behaviors in a mouse. We're trying to find proxies for autistic behaviors. We can never actually think of a mouse as being schizophrenia or depressed or autistic or whatever. That doesn't exist. The way how we have to deal with this is trying to identify behavioral changes that might plausibly serve as proxies where we can then look at mechanisms as a way of getting closer to how the same mutation might actually cause impairments in humans. So we noticed when we looked at this that there is actually a behavioral assay where in mice, mouse model of, of autism, there was an increased ability to do the same thing over and over again. And that multiple mouse models that are otherwise unrelated showed the same phenotype here. Now, we and others did not realize this when we published these previous papers because we paid no attention and most of these previous observations are actually in the supplemental material. But this observation consists in increased performance on a repetitive motor learning task, the rotor rotor assay. And it was observed, for example, in our initial studies on Urexin 1 alpha <coughs> knockout mice or in studies on the 15Q11213 duplications. So we wondered if we could use this as a proxy for repetitive behaviors or restricted interests. This assay consists of, a, it's very simple. In general, mouse assays tend to be more reliable if they're simple. You basically put a mouse on a rotating rod that accelerates. In our case, it accelerates from 4 to 40 RPM for the first two days of training with three trials each and then from 8 to 80 RPM for the second two days of training. What you measure is how fast the mouse falls off the rod. The distance to the bottom is very small, but for some reason mice don't like to fall off. They just try to stay on there. They're a good sport. What you then can measure is how fast, how long it can stay on there in the very first trial, which is the motor coordination to start off with and how well they can learn the motor task. To show you some real data, this is the Alpha 51 c Norkin. You can see they learn better, but they start at the same point. You can analyze this by putting lines through the data. The slope gives you the learning rate, and the intersection with the y-axis gives the, uh, you the initial coordination. And that leads to these bar diagrams of initial coordination which is unchanged in the, this mutant, and the learning rate, which is quite significantly increased in these mutant mice. And as it turns out, gratifyingly, the knockout has exactly the same phenotype. Same coordination, increased learning rate. So this then allowed us to have a proxy whose proxiness can be argued for repetitive behaviors. But we were interested to understand how much this ability to learn is really an ability to do the same thing over again. Is this really a, some kind of stereotypic behavior? And to determine this, we videotaped the mice as they were learning, and we measured the step timing, step length, and step location. We didn't actually measure these specific values. What we measured is how reproducible the mouse could learn to time the step to make it exactly the same length and location, because the better you learn to do it exactly the same way, the better you learn to stay on the rod. And what you can see here is 
that for each of these three core parameters, the knockouts in learning how to stay on the rod learn how to become consistent, whereas the wild type does not. So this is for step location. They learn the variation of the step decreases. That is, they learn much better how to put the step exactly at the same position. Same thing is for step length. Wild type doesn't learn this at all. It learns better to stay on there by a different mechanism. And there's a trend that's not significant for the timing. So these experiments showed that this is indeed the ability of the mouse to learn better to do the same thing over and over again. In addition to this phenotype, we also observed that these mice, both the knockout and the knock-in, had a hyperactivity phenotype. So what we have then is a gene and a molecule, neuroligand 3, and a behavior. A behavior that is, importantly, a gain-of-function behavior. It's always easier to analyze something that a mouse can do better than something that the mouse can do worse. And the issue now is, how does this change lead to that change? And in order to get after that, we use conditional knockout mice that were created, just like we always make conditional knockout mice, by floxing an exon, as you see here. And then we asked whether the conditional deletion of neuroligand 3 from either the cerebellum or the striatum would, would lead to the same phenotype. And we chose these two brain regions because in neuroscience, as you all know, motor learning is associated with the cerebellum and the striatum. We first tested the cerebellum using a Cree driver line that is specifically expressed in the Purkinje cells, the only output neurons of the cerebellum. And what we found was that there was no phenotype in motor learning whatsoever, as you can see here. But there was a phenotype in that these mice were still hyperactive. So the cerebellum neuroligand 3 does something, but it doesn't do motor learning. We then went on to the striatum. The striatum has two principal types of neurons. They're both medium spiny neurons, but they express D1 or D2 dopamine receptors and some other proteins that differentiate them. And they can be manipulated separately using Cree driver lines. We looked at D1 crease, which lock, knock out neuroligand 3 only in D1 MSNs, and it reproduced the phenotype quite nicely, as you can see here. Both the increased motor learning and the hyperactivity. When we looked at D2 neurons, when we looked at D2 neurons, there was no phenotype whatsoever. So only in D1 neurons. So now we have the type of neuron that's responsible. Deleting neuroligand 3 only from D1 neurons, phenocopies, or the total constitutive knockout. So this was interesting, but it raised a number of questions. One question is, as you probably know, the striatum is huge. It's an enormous area in the brain that is basically covering the entire inside of the cortex. Which part of the striatum? The ventral striatum, which is called the nucleus accumbens, or the dorsal striatum. And is the phenotype developmentally determined? And to address these questions, we used again stereotactic injections of viruses. What we do is we stereotactically inject in the adult animal viruses expressing either Cree recombinase or delta Cree, which is mutant Cree, tagged with GFP. You can see the GFP here in the nucleus accumbens. And that then deletes neuroligand 3 from all neurons in the nucleus accumbens. And when we did this, it reproduced the phenotype, increasing motor learning, incre hyperactivity. That was a surprising result because the nucleus accumbens is normally associated with reward behaviors. It was also surprising because this is post-developmental. This is not during development suggesting that this is a functional impairment. What about the dorsal striatum? The dorsal striatum injections had no phenotype. So only the ventral striatum. The fact that this phenotype can be induced in adult mice led us to ask whether we can also rescue the phenotype when we reintroduce neuroligand 3 into adult mice that had lacked neuroligand 3 throughout development. 
So we did a similar experiment as I showed you just before, injecting viruses into the striatum. In this case, we injected them into D1, Cree expressing mice that lacked neuroligand 3 in the D1 neurons throughout development. We injected them in the young adult mice using a Cree-dependent expression strategy, and this could fully rescue the phenotype, as shown here, demonstrating that the phenotype is indeed fully reversible during, after development. The fact that this phenotype is in the nucleus accumbens raises the issue, maybe this is simply a reflection of a loss of reward, that the mice basically just simply, uh, not a loss, a gain of reward, that they simply want to, they're more motivated, they want to stay on there longer on the rotor rod. We don't know how well this explanation fits, but in initial experiments that are relatively crude, using condition place preference for cocaine, which is a measure of reward behavior as shown here, we found no difference between the knockout and the wild type, suggesting that at least with this assay, there is no dramatic increase in reward behaviors. So finally, I'm almost done. I'm sure you're glad to hear. Uh, reception waiting outside, maybe. Um, the issue here obviously is, is this change in one particular neuron, D1 neurons in one particular brain area, ventral striatum, nucleus accumbens, is this actually a synaptic impairment? And so we measured synaptic transmission in slices from these mice. And we initially measured excitatory inputs onto D1 and D2 neurons because that was where we suspected the phenotype would be. We couldn't find anything. What you see here is an example of spontaneous minis. This is D1 minis, this is D2 minis. For excitatory synapses, there's just nothing. It has been reported that neuroligand 3 mutations cause a change in mglur dependent long-term depression that can be induced by DHPG. We don't see a change in any brain structure in the mutant whatsoever. So this doesn't explain it. We then went on and looked at inhibitory synaptic transmission, and there we observed a dramatic decrease in the frequency of spontaneous minis, but not the amplitude. This was specific for D1, but was not found in D2 neurons. It was specific for the nucleus accumbens as opposed to the dorsal striatum. And it was also observed not only for the knockout, but also for the knock-in. So it fitted perfectly. So this suggests that there's less inhibition, that there's a change in excitatory inhibitory balance. To measure this directly, we measured both EPSCs and IPSCs on the same neuron that were patched and then recorded from after presynaptic stimulation as a function of different postsynaptic holding potentials. And using that approach, we found that in D1 neurons, indeed, the inhibition excitation ratio was halved, whereas in D2 neurons, there was no change. So these mice seem to have a dramatic ability to learn better a repetitive task based on a change in the inhibition excitation ratio in D1 neurons. That sounds pretty simple. In fact, it sounds too simple to explain the specificity of the phenotype. I have no answer to why, how this can operate. I have no answer how to explain this, but we were concerned about how simple this looks. And so we wanted to test this by a completely independent approach. And so to test this by a completely independent approach, we used the expression of a potassium channel, as shown here. When you express this potassium channel in a neuron, you suppress action potential generation. And you can quantify this by measuring the number of spikes as a function of the current injection in the neuron, either in a control or in a potassium channel expressing neuron. And you can see there's a dramatic suppression of action potentials. So this manipulation causes the opposite 
to what I showed you for new ligand 3 in the D1 neurons, it increases the excitation inhibition balance or it, it, no, it increases the inhibition excitation balance or decreases the excitation inhibition balance. You get the point, okay. <laughs> and uh, I'm almost done. And, uh, and when we did this, both in D1 and D2 neurons, we found that in D1 neurons there was the opposite phenotype to the neuroligand 3 mutant. This is done again in the nucleus accumbens. So it's the opposite manipulation, so it's the opposite phenotype that fits perfectly. Whereas in the D2 neurons, which are supposed to be the counteraction to the D1 neurons, it had the same phenotype as the neuroligand 3 deletion in the D1 neurons. So indeed, we can reproduce the phenotype of the neuroligand 3 mutation by simply manipulating the excitation inhibition or inhibition excitation balance in the striatum. So at least that confirms it. And so that leads to the model where in the wild type, the D1 to D2 neurons, which form a balance of outputs, provide a certain normal learning curve for the rotor rod. When you actually change this by decreasing the D1 excitation, you get a decreased learning. When you change it by decreasing the D2 excitation, which means increasing the D1 excitation, you get an increase of learning. And when you change this by knocking out neuroligand 3 in D1, which increases excitation, you also get an increased learning. So that all that fits. The good part of these studies is that it really localizes a behavioral change to a particular cell and a particular type of synapse in a specific brain region. The other important aspect of these studies is that they demonstrate that at least for this mutation it's fully reversible, it's not a developmental phenotype. The enigma, for me at least after these studies, is that I still don't actually understand how this actually works. And there's no claim here that we're looking at a circuit. I know we all love the word circuit, but for me, this is a synapse and a cell that changes, and that is probably part of multiple circles. In fact, the only way I can think of explaining the specificity of the phenotype compared to the generality of the electrophysiology is that as a component of multiple circuits, this particular change impacts only one of these multiple circuits that the same neurons are part of. So, in closing, I've tried to tell you these two stories on top of the introduction to neuroligand, to neurexins, to put this into another more broader perspective. Using this as an illustration, what you see here is a cover from the New Yorker, a magazine, I read and love. For a couple of years ago, you see here a plague put on by a school. You see here the parents videotaping the plague. But the parents don't videotape the plague at all. They only videotape their children. Okay? So that, to me, serves as a metaphor, as a paradigm. What we are doing is basically the same thing. We are looking at one gene at a time, extensively. And what we really need to do is, by looking at one gene at a time, in the end, we need to sort of piece it together. We want to try to actually understand what happens one gene at a time by putting it all together and try to get the whole, reconstruct the whole play. And then, if there are mutations, presumably one of the actors is missing, but the others are still playing. And so both the audience and the other players presumably react to the absence of the actor. And so that is really what we're doing, I believe, when we're doing genetic manipulations. Let me close by coming back to the starting point, which is that all of this, obviously, is only a tiny window in terms of how synapses are specified. I hope that you got a feeling for what we mean with synapse specification from the dramatic effect that presynaptic neurexin 3 alternative splicing can have on postsynaptic ampere receptors, because that is synapse specification. It tells the synapse how many postsynaptic ampere receptors to have, which is characteristic for specific and particular synapses. But we really need a molecule by molecule dissection um, in order to understand this fully. 
And so this is quite a challenge which will keep all of us busy for a few years. Um, let me acknowledge the major contributors to the studies I discussed today. Jason Aoto did all the work on the Neuroaxon 3 mutations. He was greatly helped by a former postdoc, Katsuhiko Tabuchi, who initiated the generation of the mice and who has been long since gone and is now a professor in Japan. Chang He Pak, Ying Sha Zhang, and Tamash Denko did the work on the human Neuraxon mutants that I briefly mentioned in the introduction. And Patrick Rothwell and Mark Fucillo performed the Neuroligan 3 studies. I have wonderful collaborators at Stanford, in particular Marius Wernick, stem cell biologist, Axel Brunger, structural biologist, and Rob Malenka, my neighbor, with whom we perform many of the studies that are more circuit-oriented. And finally, we depend on funding for everything we do, and I'm particularly um, grateful for support by the NIMH and the HHMI. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>